Welcome everyone. On behalf of Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, the Administration for Community Living and Indian Health Service, I'd like to welcome everyone to the Long-Term Services and Supports webinar series. My name is Michaela Holm and I work for Kaufman and Associates and I'll be your moderator today. Today's webinar is titled Intergenerational Transmission of Traditional Practices and Foodways. Please note that this webinar series is supported by a contract awarded by Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. The opinions, findings, conclusions, and recommendations expressed in this webinar are those of the presenters and do not necessarily represent the official position or policies of the Department of Health and Human Services or the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. And with that, I'd like to introduce today's presenters. We have Laverne Helga Dementif and Tanisha Moses on. And so I will pass it on over to Laverne for the next steps. Thank you. Dokudin, Michaela. Adeyahuds, that means hello, everyone. Haleg, Ezra. My name is Haleg or Laverne Dementif. Dolor Chet, Katrina Chag, Yesh Hastan. Uh, my family is from Holy Cross in Anvik, Alaska, which is Southwest Alaska. So uh, Rudy and Alice Dementif Yithava Ezre. My parents are Rudy and Alice, the late Rudy and Alice Dementif. Siyoj uh, Sakangane Ve I have one son, his name is Sakangane, uh, Dragonfly uh, or Kyrie. Togatili Kayachoch Yith Nasion. I grew up in uh, the community of Ninana and the Big city of Anchorage. Kayachok um, is this though. I currently live in Fairbanks, Alaska, and UAF Traf Yeda Natan Kusine Social Work Oho. So I work um, uh, on Traf Yeda campus at the University of Alaska Fairbanks in the social work program, and I've been here since 2006. Um, I just want to say, uh, you know, the so grateful to be. Um, sharing with this with this group today. This is my first time with this group. And um, and I hope that uh, you have you find something of interest in in this presentation. And that means it's really just really good to be here with you all today. And I'll hand it over to Tanisha to introduce herself as well. Hi everybody. Hi everybody, my name is Tanisha Moses and I'm originally from Northway, Alaska. I currently work and live on the Trakeda campus in Fairbanks and I will pass it back to Laverne. Okay, then next slide, please. So the webinar objectives um, for, for this next hour really will be to discuss the impacts of intergenerational transmission of culture, um, to highlight the importance of healing spaces and remembering and reclaiming knowledge, and to identify um, decolonizing strategies for working in partnership with communities. All right, so for the past, three years, um, I've had the honor to work with amazing elders at the Danakanaga Elders Program in Fairbanks, Alaska, on a program that we're calling Elders Mentoring Elders. Uh, so when we first, uh, I actually am the co-PI for the um, this particular grant, which I'll talk about in a second. Uh, and I have a, a, a co-PI as well, Jessica Black. And, and we brought on Tanisha as a research intern probably about a year ago. Um, and when we first actually started doing work with elders, I would say it was maybe five years ago on a, on a, um, uh, a grant called Awakening the Spirit. And part of our intention with that particular grant was really to um, understand how we are uh, engaging in traditional practices today in kind of a, this modern, fast-paced, ever-changing society. How do we continue to do that today? And we wanted to talk to elders about that and, and um, just listen to their stories and, and get some guidance around that. And that was an Awakening the Spirit grant through um, what's uh, CTRP, which is a Clinical Translational Research um, 
project grant through University of Montana and University of Alaska Fairbanks uh, uh, Canner Center for Alaska Native Health Research. Uh, and through that process, we had amazing, uh, beautiful conversations with elders that shared um, many things about uh, the, the, the pain and the grief that they're still holding about the losses of culture and language and ceremonies through um, colonization and boarding schools. Um, so many of these elders talked about uh, leaving their communities at really critical times in their lives, in their lives, and um, and being away during really important ceremonies and not learning um, the things that they would have learned had they stayed in their communities. And um, and there was just a lot of grief and pain that they were expressing, as well as just so much um, love. And, uh, and in that, there was a lot of remembering that happened. And one of the things that came out of that initial research in um, about five years ago, the CTRP research, was um, the elders talking about wanting to support emerging elders to step into their roles. And that was really um, profound, I think, for us to hear. I think, you know, as an Indigenous person, um, you know, maybe not knowing my language, I'm actually a language learner. Uh, I teach language and facilitate a language class weekly, but I've been a language learner for the past 25 years. And um, I didn't grow up speaking the language. So I knew what they were talking about, right? And so when someone asks, do you know your language? Sometimes that can be and feel triggering uh, and feel there's so much to that, right? So there's so much around that, the way that um, we had, uh, the, the language was taken or the, the, the way that uh, the language is, is going to sleep and, and um, how our elders over the years protected the language for us. Um, so that today we could still, you know, uh, benefit from it. Um, so there's just a lot, I think, of emotions that happen when someone asks, do you know how to cut fish or do you know um, how to bead? Do you know uh, how to make your own regalia, right? And so the elders were noticing that there is a, um, the emerging elders that were coming up, some of them were, um, uncomfortable, maybe with feeling like they hadn't learned enough um, to share forward. And part of that cultural transmission uh, of, of that cultural continuity, right, has to do with us learning in, as Indigenous people, um, language and ceremony and knowledge, uh, the wisdom, um, and then sharing that forward with our family and with our communities and with, with youth and and so that it continues to go on into the future. And so the elders just in their wisdom said, you know, we just really want to create a space for these emerging elders to learn um, in, a, in a place that, in a space that's non-judgmental, in a space that's healing and supportive, in a space where we are all together in this work. Um, and so we created that with, uh, with two elders mentoring elders camps. Um, so, you know, I, for me, I, I'm just so proud of the, the camp and just so inspired by the elders to vision around this and their wisdom. And the camp is grounded in nurturing and supporting um, relationality in community, culture, land and food systems as a beginning to healing and becoming whole. So we think about food sovereignty work and food um, uh, um, sustainability and things like that. And part of the first initial ways that we have to engage in that is by building relationship back, right? So through decolonization and the systems that we currently have, there's so much disconnection um, to each other. There's lots of silos, compartmentalization, lots of disconnection within uh, challenges that we're faced. So depression, addiction, there's just lots of disconnection that happens and disconnection to our to ourselves, to community, to culture, to land, to food systems. And so beginning to um, reconnect, to remember, to come back together. Um, and so it is the first kind of step is building that relationship back and nurturing that and supporting that and beginning to heal and become whole around that. 
So I think that this is the, um, so one of the, the things I think Jessica Black, uh, Dr. Black and myself are really proud of is that we are two Diné scholars um, that are doing work with Diné people. Uh, and so Athabascan people are part of the Na Diné family, language family. And, um, and so we get to work with uh, elders and community members that we grew up with and that we know um, intimately uh, and um, uplift their voices. They are, their wisdom uh, can carry us into the future. They have uh, priorities for our people and um, they know what those priorities are and they want to guide us. And so we just have been feel feeling so grateful that we can support and uplift them in this work. Um, and that's huge. I think if we think about research in general uh, and we think about the ways and the intentions that we have within the research that we're doing, um, one of the uh, really important important aspects of community community led oops community led research is is that uplifting of voices. I also want to acknowledge the funders uh, and just give gratitude to to the funders of this particular project. We've been really blessed. So when we first, I mentioned that we did the CTRP research about five years ago, um, and from that, uh, the elders had shared, you know, they wanted to do this. Um, they want to support emerging elders. Um, we brought that, we went to, Jessica and I went to a, a Pearl workshop, which is promoting indigenous research leadership in Montana and talked with uh, people about this particular research, Awakening the Spirit research. And we came across a woman, uh, Valerie Bluebird Jernigan, Dr. Bluebird Jernigan, uh, who shared um, some of the work that she was doing uh, with the Center for Indigenous Innovation and Health Equity and just had a really profound, awesome conversation about the importance of food sovereignty and how our project connects to that. Um, because like, as I mentioned, that, that, that beginning part of it is nurturing that uh, relationship back to the earth and to each other and to community and recognizing there's all these disconnections and, and harm that has been happened that we are, that we are healing um, so that we can do this work. And so, um, yeah, so we just, we, we connected with Dr. Bluebird Grodingen at that uh, particular um, uh, training. And from there, we ended up getting this uh, CHE funding. Um, and CHE is funded by the Office of Minority Health. And um, CHE is based in Oklahoma and they have other sites as well, but they fund programs um, uh, support programs also in Hawaii and Alaska and um, in other places across the nation around food sovereignty work. And so we're just so grateful to have a funding entity that is also indigenous led that understands the unique challenges that we're faced with as researchers and, and implementing interventions and programs. Um, so through CIHI, uh, we also, uh, so the funding flows through what's called um, Center for Alaska Native Health Research here at the University of Alaska Fairbanks. So we just wanna also thank the Center for Alaska Native Health Research for providing that support for us to be able to do the work that we're doing. And we're so grateful, um, again, like I mentioned a year ago to include Tanisha Moses, um, who is another emerging Diné scholar. And it's just been, uh, she's been so instrumental in uh, supporting the work and data analysis and planning the camp and giving us ideas and giving us feedback. And we're just so grateful to continue to um, build our network around this. And so maybe I'll give it over to Tanisha to share a little bit of her experience. Thank you, Haleg. Um, yeah, so I was able to join last year and that was the second year that the camp had happened and it was truly a transformative experience because I learned so much. I know for me personally, I am learning my language or wanting to learn my language and also like traditional practices. I want to learn how to bead and sew, and I want to learn how to make birch bark baskets. And I also felt a little bit of shame around not knowing these things because 
I just haven't been in community. I've been in Fairbanks. And so I lost a lot of time um, being able to learn those things. And I had shared that with um, Laverne and Jessica Black. And um, some feedback they gave to me was that like a lot of our elders are feeling that too. And it just totally changed my perspective on, you know, what it means, like what this camp really means. I grew up with my grandparents and I feel really lucky that they helped raise me. Um, living with my grandma, I would visit our elders in the village and I would listen to them speak our language. I would listen to them gossip and tell stories and I would help clean. And I just really love that feeling of just being with our elders in our community and being in Fairbanks, you don't always get that. So this camp really made me feel just at home and just the role of our grandmothers and just like how important like our elders are to not only our communities, but to like our families. And I can imagine that if we work towards also healing our elders and healing, you know, the lost time they got from boarding schools or from other traumas, historical, generational family, if we can, you know, help our elders too, just like how much healing that will give to our communities and to our families, to our young families, to little children, because our grandparents' roles are so important. And so I was a little bit, you know, unsure about research, but working with, um, you know, Laverne and Jessica, they um, showed me that there are roles for, you know, people like us in research and, um, I just really love this program and I'm really honored to be able to help plan um, this year. I think what's really special about this is that all of our planning and um, our focus is on what the elders are asking for. We really listen to them at different points, beginning of you know, the camp, um, after the camp, and then we do a mid-year survey, which we're currently doing. But we really hear them and try to you know, we all have our own ideas, but we really try to give them what they're asking for. And I think that's really special. And it's a really good example of like community centered approach that we're doing. Um, yeah, that's what I have to share. And I'm just really excited for this next, this upcoming camp. It's going to be really special. I think it just gets better and better every year. So I'll pass it back over to you. Okay, then. Um, so you see the, the, the circle on the left there um, is Danakanaga. That's the partnership that we're currently in where we're working with all of the elders. And I'll talk more about Danakanaga, but I just, again, want to say thank you to um, Sharon McConnell, who's the executive director of Danakanaga, because she's been instrumental in um, helping to navigate this process with elders. The elders um, uh, really... Uh, uh, have so much respect for Sharon and um, she's worked with them for years and years. And so we just cannot do this work without Sharon and, and without Danakanaga. And so I just wanted to give them some gratitude as well. So this, this slide is um, uh, about intention. And so I wanted to just share, you know, as we engage in research, you know, just as indigenous people, but, you know, with our communities, the intention behind the research that we're doing is so important. And I think our intentions, our core beliefs, our values guide us in the ways in which we engage with our communities and our within our research. And, um, and so, you know, really thinking, uh, what is it that what what intentions do I have? What are the, the guiding beliefs, core beliefs that that I have that um, uh, are important uh, to reflect on and to ensure that are present in the research that I'm doing. And I just wanted to share a few here, and I feel like we have many more, but uh, the Alaska Native, the first one is Alaska Native cultural practices must continue to exist for another 10,000 plus years. And so, you know, I want to give an example of that. Um, I have uh, in our in our region, I'm, I'm Degaton, Athabascan, uh, one of the, the Diné um, languages, um, Athabascan languages in the interior of Alaska. And um, so I'm Degaton, the language is Degkanag, and uh, we only have a few speakers left. And I am uh, eternally grateful for my language mentors, um, the late um, Jim Dementi, and, and also um, one of my language mentors that's currently working with us still is Edna Deacon. 
uh, from Grayling and, and from uh, Jim is from Shagalik, um, for their tireless efforts to teach the language. And so I just think about, you know, uh, as, you know, uh, Jim passed when he was in his 90s and, you know, the work that he did to protect the language, to continue to teach it during uh, times of colonization and just times of extreme change, um, it, he was, he did so much for the language, uh, him and Edna and many others, um, and protected it and preserved it and taught it and taught it and taught it and said words over and over and over to us. And I just give gratitude for him because that language today in 2024, someone like me can benefits my own wellness and health and, and healing benefit from that uh, work that he's done and instills a responsibility in me to carry that forward. And so, so many of our people, our ancestors protected that for us so that we could benefit from it. And so how do we then continue to move that forward? The second one is cultural practices serve as a guide for wellness and healing in our communities, organizations, and systems. Um, and so, again, just honoring the cultural practices and ceremonies and learning from them. So our healthcare system, our uh, mental health system have uh, opportunities to learn from uh, from uh, indigenous cultural practices because indigenous cultural practices uh, are grounded in our context, in our land, um, in our communities, in our cultures, in our values, right? And so uh, when we, um, you know, are dealing with challenges, ceremonies were created to help us navigate those. And um, today we have a Western system that we do need, however, I think can learn a lot. So our Western healthcare system is often, you know, we uh, find people external to our communities, to our values, to our, um, they're external to our context, and we go seek help in many different capacities. And again, that's good, but uh, just recognizing the power of uh, plant medicine our con in our context, the power of our foods, the power of our land for healing and for wellness, um, we have to, I think, begin to integrate that back um, because that's truly what we have available to us. Wherever we are is what we have available to us in terms of our health and wellness. The third one is Alaska Native people and communities have the strength, resilience, and capacity to confront the challenges they are faced with. So I just, you know, that's about being strength focused, right? And as a society, we are actually very problem focused. We have a medical model. We often are uh, exploring what's, you know, trauma informed focus. We want to look at the trauma, explore the problem, and then think about how to fix it. And where strengths and solutions truly, or where solutions truly lie are within the strengths, right? And so, and that takes practice. It takes us all to practice together, to be able to see sometimes where the problems are so big and complex, to find those strengths and then to build on those um, as solutions. And then the last one I'll share is just Alaska Native communities should be at the helm of all research, programming, and activities that involve them. And that's just the nothing about us without us, right? Everyone kind of has heard that and knows that, but I think that that is truly where our, uh, the effectiveness comes, comes in. So intention, it, anytime we are starting and engaging uh, in work, what is the intention that we have and how can that intention of starting in a good way, doing thing, you know, uh, connecting with uh, the earth, creating a, a compassion, all of those things, how can they guide, how can we use them uh, to help us guide our methods? So again, we're just really um, proud. This is Jessica, Dr. Jessica Black on the right here in the bottom photo, or the one that's lower, um, uh, Tanisha, and then myself on the right. Um, we just have been really um, honored to be a part of this community-led research. And I think, you know, we're learning so much and just uh, happy to share because it's just been a, a real blessing. And so I think one of the things that um, we... Uh, just again, I, I mentioned it earlier, but just want to share is just uplifting the voices, right? Uplifting voices of elders, of, uh, of, of community members, uplifting our um, values, uplifting our, our ways of life, uh, the land, the language is all um, 
part of doing good research as an indigenous researcher. And so we're so happy to do that. But I, and I want to say that um, part of that process is being together on the land. And so we were very intentional. And the elders wanted to make sure that we had time on the land. So there's a, a, a camp called Howard Luke's uh, Spirit Camp, Galia, um, that is uh, on the banks of the Canada River across from, from um, the Fairbanks uh, area here. And, and so we spent at least, um, I think that first year, we spent two days there and the second year, maybe two days again, I think. Um, and it changes the, the ways in which we engage. So just being on the land is a powerful um, healing force. And so we were also able to um, do things physically like gather plants and roots and um, sit by the fire and um, eat together and and just be out in in the elements in nature, uh, grounded in this in this healing work. And so, that is one like one thing. If we can, if if researchers can get people on the land and doing things on the land, that's very powerful. The other thing that that happened was um, the elders said, "We want you to. We want to make sure we have a discussion of our values at this camp." And that's something uh, we hadn't really thought of, honestly. And, you know, we know we're guided by the values, but the elder was very clear in saying, you know, we have posters of our values, like hung up in schools and organizations and in different places. But are we talking about them? Are we engaging in stories and conversations about what that looks like to live by our values? And, um, and so they just wanted to make sure. And so we, you know, of course, supported that and built in a place for dialogue and storytelling around our values. And what we found in the camp was that was one of the most profound and um, interesting pieces for people. But they didn't want to leave that uh, particular area. And they shared just um, story after story with each other, remembering uh, storytelling. Um, and that was healing. And so one of the things I think that comes up for me in, um, in this is that, uh, you know, many emerging elders are coming to this space with, uh, they were, they were coming with these feelings of, I'm not exactly sure I have what I have to share, right? I haven't learned, learned some of these things. And I don't know if I should contribute or I feel uncomfortable contributing because what if I'm wrong? And, you know, there's all these, all this, you know, Tanisha talked about it a little bit, this just shame and, and, um, the grief that's attached to that. And, once they started participating in all of these activities, people were saying, this is actually the first time I filleted a fish like this. Um, and we're so excited to be able to share that back with their family. Or this reminded me of a time that my aunt shared this um, the way, this way with me, and then they would share that back with, with the group. Um, or this reminded me, or I remember when, you know, my, my grandpa used to tell us a story about this related to this activity. And in that process of remembering, right, there was this, uh, there's just this empowerment that happens um, about what we do know. And so, you know, um, that whole uh, aspect of, of feeling the loss and, and the grief and the shame is getting uh, replaced with all of these memories and all of this remembering and then this continued learning and realizing that there's so much that we did keep and there's so much that we do know and there's so much to share forward, which is exciting. It's so exciting. Um, and so I was just so inspired by that. I would also say uh, partnerships um, are super important. Um, Canada Chiefs Conference, Fairbanks Native Association, the Morris Thompson Cultural Visitor Center, um, some uh, programs here at the University of Alaska Fairbanks uh, partnered up with us to support uh, this, this endeavor. And it's just been um, really, really impactful. And so people are understand right the importance of reconnecting and sharing that out so our so so we can have that cultural continuity um and that 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 aspect of healing is is about you know 
coming back to ourselves and being whole in all spaces. Um, and then, uh, yeah. And so, and, and at the end of the, the, the sharings, we had talking circles and sharing circles, which was so profound. And I would maybe just ask to if she wants to add anything. Just to see how humble our elders were to talk about our values and how much they're willing to share and just like how excited they were to be in a space where they could talk about these things and learn about these things in a safe place. I just, I just wanted to share that. Um, and also that the elders really loved being at Howard Luke camp and they wanted to spend more time there <laughs> and just how good it felt to be out on the land. Um, I was surprised to hear that, but I guess maybe shouldn't be surprised. So this is just to kind of highlighting some of the things that we've done. Um, we actually had Tom Huntington, who you'll see, we'll share a short video in a second or in a few minutes, um, uh, where he's tanning a moose hide. And um, so we got to uh, help him do it. And then also just listen to his stories about uh, moose hide tanning and um, look at his tools and just feel and smell uh, the, the hide. And, um, and also just witness the love that he puts into that work. Um, and he talks about, you know, just that's um, he started doing it uh, in memory of his mom. And so just beautiful, beautiful. And we, uh, we did uh, drumming and singing was uh, an important part of it um, in which the elders really want us to continue to dig into um, what are the, what is the history and the stories behind the songs that we're singing? So having more of those conversations um, beating and tufting was a favorite, uh, caribou tufting. So the next, I think there is a picture in the next slide that I'll show in a second, just about what that looks like. But, um, you know, relearning that we had one elder that had not ever beaded and was just, um, so happy to be able to say that she's starting to bead and, and, and was beading this, uh, and tufting, um, with her fellow elders. And so cutting fish again. Um, something that, um, you know, we would all have learned growing up in fish camp and in other camps and just um, with our elders and parents. And so uh, many people, again, were, were not taught specific ways of, of cutting fish for, for drying and smoking and things like that. Gathering plants, uh, making salves, gathering root, uh, spruce roots for basket making, making snowshoes. That, that was an observation one. We listened to George Albert talk about his process about making snowshoes and how, um, you know, he, he needed them. Uh, he needed them originally is why he first started making them. Um, and, uh, and that was really profound. Knitting and mending fishnets. We'll talk about that in a bit. Repairing canoes, storytelling, making fish ice cream, making drums, uh, playing language games. So um, we just had a lot of fun. This is the caribou tufting on the left there that I was referring to. Um, so you see the tufts of yellow and purple and green, and that really is um, caribou hair, uh, but that's been dyed and used to tuft into the middle of earrings and different jewelry and, and things like that. And then on the right is our uh, excursion to collect uh, plants and roots. I think a big part of uh, our work and, um, you know, just, uh, yeah, I think, uh, questions and, and the ways in which our funders want us to address these things uh, around decolonizing and indigenizing um, so that we can, one, just practice this, this, right? Because, you know, colonization is, is just so has been is so pervasive, right? And so thinking about research and how we do that in a good way with elders and what does that look like um, for decolonizing and indigenizing our process. And, you know, there's many things that we came up with. And uh, I think I just we, uh, actually Tanisha um, created this kind of list and we talked through it about the things that we did. We felt that were really um, community uh, focused and, and, um, and, and decolonizing. And so I mentioned this already, but, you know, to remember, right, to be able to be empowered by what we do know. Um, and the fact that, you know, how that we're doing this uh, for the benefit of, of future generations and for that cultural continuity and for the healing and wellness. And so there's all those intentions that I think that guide us in the work. Mentorship, um, 
So facilitating the transfer of wisdom from respected elders to emerging elders, uh, I think that was an important piece that the elders wanted to ensure that happened. And that mentorship um, to younger elders is just about helping us, helping the younger elders then continue to mentor younger families and, and youth. And so it just continues to write intergenerationally. Um, so we want to build and, and support that process. Grounding in relationship. Um, again, as we talk about, you know, food sovereignty, uh, our relationship to land, culture, and each other, uh, that relationality, building and nurturing that is the first steps, which is, um, it, and our food is a part of every single thing that we do. So when Tom Huntington talks about moose, the, you know, tanning the moose hide, um, he shares what, you know, what happened to the animal. He talks about uh, where that food went. He talks about who gave him the hides. He talks about, you know, um, uh, spiritually being connected to them and how we can, how we can um, um, do that in a good way. Uh, and so all of that is, it's all connected to food, to food systems, to, to food sustainability. Um, we're learning things, you know, that, um, just our, our values don't take, you know, too much or don't take the last of anything from a specific patch so that it continue to grow forward. So elders are constantly adding in this, these, this information um, that supports uh, our way of life and way of being. Um, and that, you know, just part of it is skill development, right? So observing, um, we have observed a lot as well, as well as did a lot. And observing is an important part of, of the process as well and listening. Um, I mentioned the values dialogue already, how important that was, uh, celebration and ceremony, um, always, that's always a part of it, always having fun celebrating with food and ceremony, um, prayer um, from the elders is necessary, spirit, adding spirit in that, um, legacy and responsibility, healing and resilience, um, so that safety to be our whole selves in these spaces. So the evaluation process, we're still going through. So it's really uh, an ongoing process, but we have overarching questions that we want to get at. Like, what is the transmission of knowledge uh, or how, you know, um, to what extent has, has the intervention contributed to transmission of knowledge? How has it increased the relationship and consumption to traditional foods? How has it increased access to learning about traditional practices? And how has it increased the use of traditional practices among indigenous communities? So these are the things that we're looking at. And the data collection, um, again, this is kind of what we began, we're starting with, but I think we're growing in understanding how to um, understand this process better. And so I'm, I'm hoping this becomes a little bit more um, uh, indigenized and decolonized, but we started with pre and post surveys for, for both camps, which uh, you see the number of participants at each camp. We held focus groups uh, after the 2023 camp. So just elders sharing together about what they liked and what they want to see. Um, we organized Facebook messages. There was just a ton of Facebook information. We transcribed discussions from talking circles and sharing circles, and so we're currently coding them. Um, and Tanisha is a huge part of this process, kind of uh, helping us organize all of this data to make sense of it. Um, we coded two mid-year surveys, um, well, coded one mid-year survey, and we're working on the next mid-year survey. Um, we're looking at, uh, we, we actually held four mini workshops between camps, so across the year. So after every mini workshop, um, there was an evaluation for, for uh, understanding how they were how they were um, experiencing that. So the mini workshops were tufting, sourdough bread, fish ice cream, making fish ice cream, and cusp buck making. And then we also looked at uh, anecdotal evidence during our team meeting. So just talking about what people are sharing back with us uh, individually and within the community. So our initial findings really are, um, and we I talked about this throughout, so I'm not gonna just harp on this, but just like that elders, emerging elders are more confident and empowered to talk about and share. Um, that's come across a time and time again. Uh, elders helped to promote a safe space to learn. Uh, participants felt safe sharing what they've done, that they've never done something before. And we're so excited and glad to have the opportunities to learn without criticism and judgment. 
Um, and many emerging elders were able to remember a lot of their teachings throughout the camp and added to their own knowledge. So uh, the other thing that I just want to say, the, the, uh, that, uh, and this is something I mentioned, but just grounding participants in Athabascan values is an essential foundation for culture camp. So that's one of the things that we're taking away. Um, the elders shared that values are rules for living and are meant to be practiced daily. Uh, the camp promoted healing, connection, and hope. That was uh, what we hoped for, but also just an outcome. We, we the elders talked about in the talking circle um, continuously just about that, the, the importance of healing uh, and hope and, um, and really uh, being, uh, taking action um, that, um, you know, just the impact of boarding schools and that how that disconnected people from the culture and language and just taking action um, to to begin to learn, relearn and remember and heal. I wanted to share these and I um, I just wanted to say, you know, these are and we someone wrote, wrote in the slide in the uh, chat if there's going to be um, uh, contact information and and if we're going to share the slides and I'm so happy to do that I think we we're, we're fine to share slides so you can review these but I'll just read a few of them you know I appreciate learning all of this stuff because I want to hand it down to my kids and grandkids um, so what a participant shared that he hasn't done beating in 35 years and that he's getting back into it to teach his grandchildren that live outside of Alaska. Um, yeah, there was just a lot of thank yous. Thank you for making this happen. It's so awesome to wake up each morning. Uh, it's smoke and all, it was smoky from wildfires during our one of our camps. And know you're going to be learning and sharing great things from elder professionals in our region. Thank you to these five entities that have our well-being as one of their top priorities. Uh, again, some more quotes. So um, one of the, the quotes, every night I went to bed and I was excited for the next day. These three days was a celebration of what we do have. And I feel like I went to potlatch. I ended up with so many gifts. Um, and then if, you know, if we, if we don't practice it, we forget it. We lose it. We, we lose what we are. Um, so elders teach us to walk in the footsteps of our ancestors as we leave our own footprints for generations to come. So we wanted to kind of give you just a, a little snippet of... Um, of the elders actually talking about this process. And so we're gonna play uh, about a nine minute video for you all here. You know, for me working on Mushkin, I uh, really reconnects me with what, who I am, where I come from. I did this because I wanted to do something nice uh, when we had a memorial potlatch for my late mother. And, um, and then it just uh, doing it made me reminisce, uh, reminisce about all the, basically the grandmas that did it. And uh, the childhood memories of uh, them coming to me while I was doing it. And it just, um, those memories lay dormant and there was no reason for me to think of them. And when I was doing it, it's a lot of solitary time and um, it just sparked something in me to honor my late mother. Right there. You start all over right there? The yeah. yeah. Why do you make them that wide? Because for salmon, <laughs> depends on how big the salmon is. We could do this by ourselves. Yeah. Just put a nail on the wall and it used to be easy when we were young. <laughs> She never said a word. She just used her arms to, to tell us to be quiet. And I remember the patience as I reflect on it, just her patience, just so calmly moving her arms to keep us quiet. By the end of the day, she went get poking up like this for us to look and hear. There was that beautiful bird nest that the birds had made. You know, it warms my heart when I think about it now. The training and the teaching that she had 
uh, just in that small lesson without ever saying a word. We, we depend on our elders when I was growing up. Someone asked me one time, you travel a lot, you, what's your advice to young people? Thank you, thank you. You listen to the elders, you can't go wrong. A good bending birch has got to, real important is right here. They all got to be, you notice that's narrower than here. So you put this on, then you adjust that one and all the way down. He was 18 years old. He asked me for to use my boat, I told him, go ahead. He went out there and to my surprise, he came back with berries mm -hmm. made out of mm -hmm. birch bark basket, same way I showed him when he was six years old. Wow. And 18 years old, he came back and brought berries to raise grandma. And <laughs> now wow. he's teaching his kids. Yeah. So uh, I needed snowshoes. That, that's why I decided to try to make my own. I didn't. I never knew it would come to the point where it is now. You know, I just I just needed snowshoes. And, but uh, I have to take the part for this and the part for this out of different trees. That way, it don't twist. If they're working against each other, you know. Now, when I first made the frame. We come back from camp. I made it out in camp. And I didn't know what to do after that. I didn't know how to fill it. So Auntie Agnes uh, filled it for me. And then went, we moved back to trapping camp and I copied it. I copied how she did it. And uh, people, they always say that they're going to buy these just to hang on a wall. They call it a work of art, but these are built to be used. These are built to function. My native name is Tadju. Taj, people call me. And so um, the elder people always call me by my native name. And uh, now I have to teach the young elders uh, how to say my name, which is nice. Some of them didn't know what I know about growing up with elders because they were sent off to boarding school. And I saw that that's one of the broken pieces in, in our culture and that the young people didn't know what to do. And this was a good place to start, not just talking about it, we have to put action to those words. And that's what we did, is to put action to those words. If we don't start talking about our own knowledge and practicing it, it'll be lost. We will have to be reading in the book how to make this from somebody else's culture. There it goes back again to the circle of knowledge. But we have to step up. I used to do this when I was a little kid. Yeah. Oh, you time. never forget. Yeah. I just needed a reminder. You just gotta keep doing it. <laughs> you go home make one now. <laughs> She's an expert. Cause she done it before. Doop. 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 You're never too old to learn. And I always tell the young people, get as much education as you can because you have the opportunity. I brought it home. And when I got sick, I started working on it. 
And this is what I finished. This is a baby strap. It's not work. I was sick. And it was healing to me. It's spiritual work. Today, you look out there, and it's amazing to see an elder out there putting drum together. And now we're teaching them in camps. I suggest if you're an elder and you have culture camp, get to that camp and teach those young elders. I'm so grateful for you. And someday I want to be an elder like you. You will. You listen to the elders. I don't think you'll go wrong. Thank you. It's so hard to watch that and not just like get emotional and it really touches my heart. And um, we have another four years. So moving forward, we're going to be having this camp for the next four years, thanks to the CHE funding. And each year we're really going to focus on listening to the elders and priorities um, and how to best uplift them. And I think that's what has made this a success. Um, Laverne, is there anything else you'd like to share? Yeah, well, I think we're open to uh, comments and questions. Um, that I just wanted to highlight the the video of Dr. Elizabeth Flegel making teaching mending the net um, is a really just a great thing to end on because it really uh, I was just so in awe. You know, she's talking about teaching us how to create a fishnet, mend fishnets. Um, so that if anything ever happened in the future, that is a skill that we could rely on for survival. And um, and doing that in the wintertime when she was a little girl, that's what they would just work on. And what a mindful, uh, healing, uh, lovely process. And so I was just so inspired by that and just inspired by the profoundness of, wow, having this skill, should I ever need it, is just an amazing thing. So um, we're just so grateful to share this with you all. And we'd love if you have any questions or thoughts or comments. Thank you. Yes. Just like they said, this is our time for questions. Um, you can place your questions in the Q&A box or you could raise your hand and we can unmute your line as well. All right, we do have one question. What advice would you offer to other communities with an interest in hosting their own cultural camp for elders? That's such a great question. And we, we've presented on this in other um, areas of the country in different aspects. And people have shared that they have resonated with this idea that they're, um, that, you know, with all the losses and thinking about how to reclaim that and remember and wanting to support emerging elders. And um, so I think there's a just an, a growing energy and interest in really um, uh having these having our elders guide guide us in what this looks like and i think i would just say that is the key um in your context in your communities is just that we you know starting to listen and um you know and if there's not you know in fairbanks we're lucky to have the denakanaga program which is the uh 
voice of the elders. And so they, um, that's what they do is they listen constantly to the voice of the elders and what their priorities and what their teachings are, um, in terms of programming and, and things like that. So, um, they're a great model. You could actually look them up. I'll put, uh, their website, um, in the chat here as well. Great. And I know that kind of touched on one of the other questions we have, but do you know of any other programs similar to this? You know, I have not um, heard of programs specifically like this. I think there's a lot of different um, researchers and community um, uh, community uh, individuals working in community that are doing amazing things. I think at the top of my head, he might actually be on this call, uh, Dr. Jordan Lewis, working on successful aging in Alaska. Um, and that is, his work has just been so profound and, um, in thinking about, you know, what does successful aging look like in so much of our um, our literature historically has been focused around the pathology of aging and and what do Alaska Native elders say about what it means to successfully age uh, in their communities and and how do we support that? So I would just say his work is something that comes to mind, but I haven't specifically heard of elders mentoring elders in the past. I haven't either, but I just wanted to add that here in Alaska, tribes will put on culture camps, usually in the summertime. So just connecting with your tribe, because um, I know that there is funding out there for stuff like that, too. Great. Thank you. Um, if there's any other questions, we have about one more minute if you want to place it in the chat or in the Q&A box. Um, and then also the link was posted in the chat box, too, that they were referencing. I'm not seeing any other questions coming through. Thank you, Laverne and Tanisha, uh, for joining us today. This was a really great presentation and the video was just beautiful. Um, so in closing, I would like to remind everyone that today's webinar is recording and the audio and presentation slides will be made available on the cms.gov website at a later time. So thank you all for joining us today and our session is now concluded. Thank you all.